إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُصْلِحُونَ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ الْمُفْسِدُونَ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ قَالُوا أَنُؤْمِنُ كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَهَاءِ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ السُّفَهَاءُ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَى شَيَاطِينِهِمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهْزِئُونَ الله يستهزئ بهم ويمدهم في طغيانهم يعمهون أولئك الذين اشتروا الضلالة بالهدى فما ربحت تجارتهم وما كانوا مهتدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد once again everyone السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Our intention today inshallah ta'ala is to continue on from ayah number 12 We finished up to ayah number 12 where the hypocrites were addressed for the first time and it could also be the possibility that, that the leaders of the Jewish community and some of the followers uh, that were two-faced were being addressed for the first time and they were told don't cause corruption in the land la tufsidu fil ard two points that i wanted to make before we went on onwards is the use of the word ala in the quran ala innahum humu sufaha ala innahum humul mufsidun the word ala in the arabic they say it's harfun yaftatihu bihi al-kalam lit tanbih it's actually a device a preposition if you will that is used to just get your attention. Now, for a believer, everything Allah says gets our attention. It's not like anything Allah says doesn't get our attention. But there are certain occasions in which as a teacher, because Allah Azza wa Jal is the teacher in the Qur'an, عَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنِ فَهُوَ الْمُعَلِّمْ لِلْقُرْآنِ He decides that there are some places where you, have to, you are in danger of not realizing the seriousness of an issue. You really have to go out of your way and pay attention to this part. So he says, Ala innahum humul mufsidun. You had better know, yani i'lamu, intabihu. Innahum humul mufsidun. They're in fact the ones that cause all the corruption. So Allah is highlighting that these people, because the munafiqun and this element of the community, they were all mixed together with the Muslims. They're not clearly separate lines. But this kind of talk is poisonous. And you may not realize how poisonous it is. So Allah Azza wa goes out of his way to make you and me cautious. That don't get near this kind of conversation. Don't get in, into the conversation in which you know m- mixing the lines between truth and falsehood is done in the name of compromise, mediation. Let's just make peace between parties, etc., etc. That there is room for mediation, there is room for peace, but there are certain things in which there is no room at all. And when it comes to the truth, it is the truth. When it comes to our deen and ibadah to Allah, it's the deen. There's no there's no room for negotiation or you know anything else. So in that matter, Allah Azza wa Jal is very, very stern, saying, "Ala innahum humul mufsidun." This is not a normal form of speech. The other thing is, I didn't highlight yesterday that first of all, Allah uses "inna," which is harfut tawkid. It's called a, a device used for emphasis. Wali izalat shak. They say harfun li izalat shak. Inna means certainly, and the point of it is to say there should be no doubt left in your mind about what I'm about to say because I began with the words certainly. Then he used the pronoun, which is hard to translate in English. The pronoun they is actually used twice. In nahum, humul mufsidun. The hum is used twice. And the suggestion of that is these people, they like nobody else. They're the ones that are causing corruption. Like they're the ultimate source of corruption. And so the pronoun is actually mentioned twice against them. The third problem here is that this is what's called in basic Arabic, it's called the jumla ismiya. And the khabar, the predicate, you know, there's the subject of the sentence and the predicate. Let's not even get into English grammar. There's the first part of the sentence and there's the last part of the sentence, okay? The last part of the sentence, typically in Arabic, does not come with an al. You don't put an al on it. You take it off, that's this, a kind of a standard. But Allah Azza wa goes out of His way to drop an al on al-mufsidun. Innahum hum al-mufsidun. And the suggestion there is, yet again, if, as if Allah was not enough, as if inna was not enough, as if, you know, home twice was not enough, now there's an al on top of that. They are ultimately the source of corruption. Like, if you were to try to put this as a text message or something, it would have five or six exclamation marks at the end. And they're just embedded into the grammar of the language. Right? That's actually one of the reasons, of the many reasons why Allah Azza wa chose 
the Arabic language for his speech, is that through few words, not only words are communicated, emotions are communicated. You know, in English, for example, if I'm speaking with you and I say, hey, nice to see you, uh, and I wrote that to you as a text message, nice to see you, or nice to have seen you today, you don't know the emotions with which I wrote that to you. I could have been sarcastic, <laughs> nice to see you today. It could have been that way. Or it could have been, nice to see you today, casually. Or it would have been, so nice to, nice to see you, man, today. Like, the emotions are something else. The text is something else. The text is actually cut off from the emotions. And a lot of times when you send somebody a message, or you email someone, or you write to someone, then the emotions can actually be confused. What did you mean by that? Like somebody says, okay, but are they saying, okay? Or are they saying, okay? Are they saying, okay? Like, what, which okay is it? You know, are we okay? <laughs> you know, so what Quran does, the, the, the language of the, especially ancient Arabic is such, not only are the meanings and the words captured, but actually through the rhetorical devices that are within the Arabic language, the emotions that are intended, the anger that's intended, the intensity that's intended, the exclamation marks necessary are all captured within. It's amazing. It's really, truly amazing. And that's why it's very important for Hufad of the Qur'an, young and old, children that have memorized Qur'an, young men and women that have memorized the Qur'an. It's extremely important for them to be students of the Arabic language. Nowadays in the Ummah, we have a culture, lots of people are memorizing Qur'an, Alhamdulillah, we we're good at it. We're good at our kids can, within two years, within a year and a half, within three years, they can finish memorizing the entire Qur'an. But the problem is, they know the words of the Qur'an, they know the tajweed of the Qur'an, but they don't understand the emotions of the Qur'an. Right? You can't be talking about fire and chains and you know, boiling and speak about it as though you're, you know, you're talking about flowers. The, the tone is different. It's not happy. Right? So it actually affects even the way in which the reciter recites and what they recite. And so it's important that we you know, emphasize, especially, it's not their fault, our children, that they don't know the language, but as the parents who have taken the time to help their children memorize the Qur'an, well, then you should take the time to, take, to make sure your children also understand the language of the Qur'an. Because that's actually why you truly made them re memorize it. So they can internalize this word and benefit from it, especially in their prayers. Now in any case, that's the, that's the second, the, the first thing I wanted to highlight was about Allah and the devices that are used in this ayah. The second is the difference between Fasid and Mufsid before I go on. Fasid in Arabic means a corrupt person. A corrupt person. And a Mufsid is actually the Ta'addi of it, which means someone who isn't just corrupt themselves, they make sure other people become corrupt. يعني يسببون الفساد في الآخرين They cause corruption in other people. Here you are people talking about we should make reconciliation. But this kind of mindset, when they sit with others and say, I don't know why the Muslims are so hard on their stance. Why can't they compromise a little bit? And they're softening the sense of other Muslims as well and weakening their thinking about Islam and dwindling their confidence in Islam. They're spreading a poison. They're spreading corruption. So within, within the Ummah, when the Muslim doesn't carry Islam properly, and on top of that, they have, a, first of all, they have a weak internalizing of Islam, and then they spread that weakness among family and friends. Then they're not just corrupt, they're causes of corruption. You know, Allah innahum humul mufsidun. And they don't even realize. Walakin la yashurun. They have no realization of what they're doing. Now, on the next, in the next case, very interesting language. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ When it's said to these people, Believe like the people have believed. That's the rough translation of the first part of this ayah. Believe as though the people have believed. Now what is this talking about? What's being said here, first of all, inside the word qila, it is said. When you say it is said, that's called a passive form. When you use the passive, you're purposely going away from who spoke. Like if I say, it was said that the prayer will be delayed. The question is, who said it? I know it was said, but from who? The speaker is made a mystery. And the, there's always a reason to make the doer, in this case the speaker, a mystery. And the reason for that is to suggest that this gathering is private. In other words, these hypocrites have demonstrated their behavior and they're trying to go out of their way to impress the Prophet ﷺ. And these are not, they're not, they don't have a sticker on their forehead that says hypocrite. They're just among the Muslims. And some of the other Muslims who are not munafiqun, they're concerned, man, you, you're, this is not good what you're doing. I need to talk to you. Can I talk to you in private? And they pull them aside. And they try to kind of advise them in a private setting. And that's captured in إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ When it is said to them, 
meaning in a private setting. It is said to them, Aminu, you should believe. The, the thing is, didn't they come and say, Amanna billahi wa bil yawmil akhir, we believe. And now their friend is coming and telling them, you really should believe, you know. Like their friend sees right through it. But then again, we, I, I explained to you, I spent quite a bit of time explaining to you, you can't judge Iman, because Iman lies where? Inside the heart. So why are their friends or anybody else, any concerned Muslims, coming to them and saying, you should really have Iman. Now Iman inside the heart is one thing. But when you have Iman inside your heart, then it manifests in certain ways. There's a certain character, there's a certain attitude, there's a certain personality that comes as a result of Iman. And part of that personality is there's no desire to prove yourself to anyone other than Allah. You don't have to show off to anybody, you don't have to prove, your, you know, display yourself to anybody, demonstrate your faith to anybody. And so there pe people are coming to them and saying, look, Abu Bakr is also a believer, Umar is also a believer, you know, Sa'ad is also a believer. These are, these are all believers too. They're not doing what you're doing. How come you can't have Iman like they have Iman? How come your iman, your faith, doesn't inspire you to behave in the way that they're inspired to behave? That's what they're being told. You, you know, we don't, I don't understand why you can't just get along with everybody else, be like everybody else. The other fascinating thing here is, kama aman al-nas, the word nas is used, not kama aman al-mu'minun, kama aman al-muhajirun, kama aman al-sabiqun. You should believe like the best of them. Or you should believe like the foremost. I even mentioned the foremost, Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar radiallahu anhu. I mentioned the foremost. But that's not what the ayah says. The ayah says they were, they, were, they were approached and they were told, you should believe like people do. In other words, there are people just like you. We're just like you. Other people, they're not some high caliber, you know, sahaba that were with the Prophet ﷺ from the very beginning. But even we don't do what you guys are doing, man. It's not that hard. What we're, what's being asked of you to do, even people, regular people can accomplish and they have. Others said Anas is used for affiliation purposes. So since some members of the Jewish community are being talked to, you know, it's like they're making reference to people like Abdullah ibn Salam, you know, who've become believers. And they're, they're shamil within Nas, they're included within the phrase Nas. So they're being told, look, there are other people who've actually, you have enough good examples around you, why aren't you acting like this? And this is one of the trait, you know, signature qualities of the munafiq. The munafiq actually can be in the best company and still not benefit. And there's one thing that a person is in bad company, right? And they're surrounded by people who don't pray. They're surrounded by people who don't believe. They're surrounded by people who use filthy language. And over time, that starts affecting them. They start using dirty language. They, start, they stop praying. They, it starts affecting them. But then there's a person fortunate enough that their company is all good people. And when your company is good people, you have less of an excuse to mess up, isn't it? And that's why their friends have come to them and said, look, you're surrounded by great people. What's happened to you? Why isn't your iman healthy? Aminu kama aman nas And these people have become, they're so far gone that their response is, qalu anu'minu kama aman sufaha Oh, we, we should believe like the way the fools, the idiots have believed? That's their response. What do they mean by this response? It's important to understand. A fool is someone who doesn't consider the consequences. Aslu safah naqsun wa khiffatul aql wal hilm. The origin of the word foolishness, safa or stupidity, is actually not ha you know some diminished level of intellect and not being able to make mature decisions. Al kafawi actually, I'll, I'll get to that later on. But you know, the idea of a fool in their mind, you have to understand why would they call the Sahaba or other Muslims of Medina fools? Because if you're smart, you're going to protect your future. If you're smart, you're going to save yourself. You're not going to go into a war. You're going to protect your savings. You're going to think about what's going to happen next year. You're going to plan for your future investments, your retirement. Nowadays it could be you've got to save for college. You've got to save and you've got to buy a house. You've got to do this. That. You have financial plans, family plans. You have all these plans in front of you. You know, these people were not that different from us. They also had plans like we do. We have plans for our families, they had plans for their families. But then they see these Sahaba, what did Abu Bakr come with? What property did he come with to invest in Medina? Or what did Uthman come with? What did, what, these people came bankrupt to Medina. They left everything they owned, where? Back in Mecca. The only treasure they brought with them is Iman, that's it. 
And they're like, man, these guys were doing well back in Mecca. They were, they had good businesses, they had property, they had homes. You know, they had, they were, they were doing well in society, and they chose to become homeless, and they chose to become immigrants living on welfare. This is what they chose, and you're saying that all of this great decision that they made was inspired by their iman, their faith. It doesn't sound very smart to me. It sounds pretty stupid to me. So when they're told, you should be making sacrifices inspired by those that have already made sacrifices, they're like, no thanks. That didn't seem like a very smart decision to me. That's pretty extreme what they did, I think. I think you should have a balanced approach. You know, I don't think that's a very good approach that they took. And that's why they call them sufaha. Anu'minu kama amana sufaha. And these are the same people that are ready and willing to walk into battle. Why should I go after them? They've already lost their home, their property, their status in society. They've lost everything anyway. What do they have to lose by going into battle? We have something to lose, you know. I don't want to go into battle. I don't want to go face the Quraysh. What's my beef with them? I have no, I have no issues with them. And so they say, anu'minu kama amana sufaha. And what is the universal manifestation? What the universal lesson that comes from this? The universal lesson that comes from this, again I told you, their believers of that time had much more sacrifices than we do. Their hypocrites were much worse than we are. But in a lesser, much lesser sense, but still in a true sense, these ayats still apply to us. But how do they apply to us? You know, today, you have, you know, we're living in different, you know, people are watching all over the world. You accept Islam, and when you accept Islam, you have to make certain changes in your life. Whether you accept Islam, meaning you took shahada, you used to be Christian, Jewish, Hindu, agnostic, atheist, whatever you, Buddhist, whatever you used to be, you became Muslim, there are going to be some changes in your life. Or you were Muslim, but you were asleep, and then Allah woke you up. And then the Islam inside you woke up. There are going to be certain changes in your life. The, the, those changes are going to be very visible to your family and friends. You're going to sit in different company now. You're not going to enjoy the same old parties that you used to, because you see certain things are not permissible in those parties. You're going to notice that the way you used to make money is not very good, so you're going to lose some business. You might even have to quit your job as a result. There were some associations, friends, you know, affiliations you used to enjoy, and they were a regular part of your life, and you've cut yourself out of those associations, because those things led to bad, bad to worse, to worse, to worse. So you're going to become more and more and more isolated when you, turn, when you take your religion seriously at first, because there are certain things your religion doesn't allow you to do. And the people around you have no problem with it. So they'll notice that you've become weird. You've become isolated. You've become cut off. And they're going to call you a fool. And when you try to give them da'wah, or you try to say, hey, you should listen to this. Hey, why don't you come to the masjid with me? They're going to say, no, you want me to be like you? Is that, is that what you want? You want me to be, be turned into a weirdo extremist like yourself? No thanks. You're going to hear these words from your cousins, your siblings, your family members, your friends. Those are the people that are going to think you're strange. You're an idiot for doing what you're doing. You're, you're way too extreme, man. Just relax. Take a balanced approach like me. Gulp, gulp, gulp. You know? <laughs> you know? So this, this problem still exists. It still exists. أَنُؤْمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَحَا Allah turns around and says, أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ السُّفَحَا you had better realize. You see Allah again? Yani intabihu, pay attention. You better realize, you better not forget. Those people, they and only they, like no other, are the ultimate idiots. They are the ultimate fools. In what sense are those people fools? Now, I told you what they thought of as foolish. They thought of as foolish that you're missing out on life. You made all these sacrifices for what? Jannah is easy, man. You don't have to make all these sacrifices. Be a little bit good in Ramadan, catch the 27th or something, and you'll be fine. You know? But then, on the other side, when Allah calls them fools, He has a different definition of fool, doesn't He? So we have to think about, how does Allah mean fool? And so Al-Kafawi rahimahullah, pondering over what does Allah mean by a fool? Because we know what they meant by a fool. We need to understand what Allah means by a fool. He comments, comments on it like this, and I won't translate first, because it's so poetically written. I'll read the whole thing first, and I'll come back and translate. ظاهر الجهل عظيم العقل خفيف اللب ضعيف الرأي رديء الفهم مستخف القدر سريع الذنب حقير النفس مخدوع الشيطان أسير الطغيان دائم العصيان ملازم الكفران لا يبالي بما كان وما يكون وأو سوف يكون سبحان الله 
Lahirul Jahal. He's obviously just led by his vile emotions. Whatever comes in his mouth, he says. Whatever he feels like doing, he does. Adimul Aqal. He refuses to think. Think about what you're doing. Ah, forget it, man. I don't want to think about it. You think for me. Khafiful Lub. No, very light in their ability to ponder and reflect. You know, when you drown your ears out with music and it's constantly pounding in your head, or you're just, your eyes are exhausted with episode after episode after episode, what, what time do you have left to think? Even when the, when the screen is off, you're thinking about the next episode. You're not thinking about why you exist, or what your purpose is for exist. like you don't, you know? And those mindless beats are still pounding in your head as you're walking around. That's all that's going on in your head. It's taken over. Khafiful lub. They they don't use this this incredible thing Allah gave the human being, this mind. They've numbed this mind. It has its own kind of drugs. And and, and like an addiction to entertainment is a drug by itself. That kills your ability to think. It kills your ability to use your mind for what it should be used for. And it's not just for young people. We have elders in our community addicted to soap operas or aunties addicted to Pakistani dramas and you know. Ab kya hoga? Unki shadi hogi ke nahi hogi? Like they're gonna, you know, they're just drowned in this stuff. Da'if or ra'yi. Weak in forming any opinion. I don't know, I'm not sure. Living a whole life of I'm not sure, I don't know. No, nothing's clear in life. Radi'ul fahmi. You know, just completely like uh, rejected in terms of understanding. In other words, they don't, they don't care to develop an understanding of anything. Mustaqifful qadr, and now they're less and less, and less capable. Sari'u dham, very quick to do sins though. Very quick to do sins. Haqirun nafs. Basically, no dignity, of, no respect for self. Then no self respect. Makhdu'u shaitan, completely deceived by shaitan. Asiru tughyan, they've become a prisoner to their own disobediences to God. They are addicted to sinning against Allah. Prisoners to rebellion. Da'imul isyan, constantly sinning. Constantly doing evil. Mulazimul kufran, completely, the only thing they're committed to is ingratitude. They just can't be grateful. Always entitled for more and more and more. لا يبالي بما كان أو لا لا ولا بما هو كائن أو سوف يكون. They don't care about what has been, what they've done in the past, what they're going to be do, what they're doing now, and what they're going to be doing. No care or consideration for consequences. What what's a bigger fool than that? ولا إنهم هم السوفا. Those carefree, you know, completely oblivious people. They are the ultimate fools. I wanted to re- read something to you. Uh, about a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about fools. Since the fools have come up according to Allah's point of view, the Prophet ﷺ mentions, إِنَّهَا سَتَأْتِي عَلَى النَّاسِ سِنُونَ خَدَّاعَ People will suffer from an age, from years and years and years that are going to be very deceptive. Meaning, years are going to overshadow humanity that are going to be very deceptive. يُصَدَّقُ فِيهَا الْكَاذِبِ The liar is going to be believed in those days. وَيُكَذَّبُ فِيهَا الصَّادِقِ And the one who tells the truth will be considered a liar. وَيُؤْتَمَنُ فِيهَا الْخَائِنِ And the one who cannot be trusted will be entrusted. وَيُخَوَّنُ فِيهَا الْأَمِينِ And the one who should be trusted will be considered untrustworthy. وَيَنْتِقُ فِيهَا الرُّوَيْبِضَ And this weird group called Ruwaybida are going to be the ones doing all the talking. And the Sahaba got worried. What is this Ruwaybida? We've heard of Khain, we've heard of Kadib, we've heard of Sadiq. What is this Ruwaybida? So they said, Wamar Ruwaybida. What is Ruwaybida? Who are these people that are going to be doing all the talking? He said, The fool that talks about matters of the public. The fool that takes the public microphone and discusses what should happen in society. I don't think we are living in a more appropriate time to read this hadith than today, when the fool speaks about what should go on in the public. As-safihu yatakallamu fi amri al-amma. You know? With no consequence of was or what is, nothing. Just run your mouth. <laughs> Subhanallah. Now this is, this is narrated by Imam Ahmad. Now, ala innahum humus sufaha, walakin la ya'lamun. The, the, the next part of this problem, وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And when they do come to meet those who've believed, See, they were, one thing was, some people went to them in private. That was the previous scene. They went to them in private and said, come on guys, get your act together. And they said, yeah, no thanks. We're not going to be like those idiots. That was their response. But now the next scene is not people are going to them, they are coming to the Muslims. 
So now they're coming to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Or they're in the company of a large gathering of believers. Here, they cannot afford to show their true colors. You have to understand the contrast from the previous ayah to this ayah. In the previous ayah, they were in private so they can talk freely and say, these are fools. But when they come out in public, and they're with the same people they used to call fools, they have to put on a different face. So they put on this face and say, وَإِذَا لَقُلْ لَذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا When they meet those who already had iman, who've already believed, they say, of course we believe too. We've believed, yeah. We're with you guys. Just in the previous ayah, Allah already told us what they really think. What they re- and now we're learning that they're gonna, at face, they're gonna be very impressive. You know? Allah Azza wa Jal describes in Surah Al-Munafiqoon their, their attitude and how impressive they can be. وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَهُمْ تُعْجِبُكَ أَجْسَامُهُمْ وَإِنْ يَقُولُوا تَسْمَعْ لِقَوْلِهِمْ When even the Prophet ﷺ is told, even when you see them, you will be impressed with their physical presence. You know, in that ayah, the word ajsam, bodies. تُعْجِبُكَ أَجْسَامُهُمْ Instead of saying, يُعْجِبُونَكَ They will impress you. No, their physical bodies will impress you. Why did Allah say that? Because their hearts are dead. And when your heart is dead, the only thing left is what? A body. Their, their physical body will impress you. Others commented that they will be very well fed because they don't do any sacrifice, so they eat a lot. <laughs> so their physical bodies will be pretty well taken care of. And they'll have newer and newer clothes every time. Here you have sahaba that are giving everything up to prepare the Muslims. And here they are every time decked out. You know, خَرَجَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فِي زِينَتِهِ لَيْ قَارُونَ So, تُعْجِبُكَ أَجْسَامُهُمْ And they speak very eloquently. They're very good at speaking. So when they speak, you listen to what they have to say. تَسْمَعْ لِقَوْلِهِمْ كَأَنَّهُمْ خُشُبُمْ مُسَنَّدَ They're like leaning planks of wood. Leaning planks of wood, Allah describes. What, 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 what kind of image is leaning? خُشُبُمْ مُسَنَّدَ First of all, khushub is used. It's so amazing, the language of the Qur'an. Let's talk first about musannada. Musannada means things that are lined up together. Now you know you have in the backyard nowadays, you have the fence, you got those planks that are standing, pl- planks of wood. And the back of it is one, one plank that's holding them all in line. Yeah? But imagine a, a fence where nobody's holding anything back. They're just leaning. From a distance, it looks like it's a pretty good fence. But just a little bit of wind, and what's going to happen? Dominoes. It's gonna, one is going to fall, and as a result, all the others are going to fall. This is actually khushub musannada. And the other interesting thing is the word khushub is not just used for planks of wood. Khushub is used for hatab linnar. It's actually used for wood that has no other purpose but to burn. Allah gives them an imagery. They are like fire, they are like wood, who is, who's good for nothing but what? what? For burning. And that's actually the imagery of their conclusion in the hellfire. May Allah not make us of them. So, وَإِذَا لَقُلْ لَذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا When they meet the people who believe, they come out and say, we've, of course we've believed. Amanna. وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ And when they are in solitude, heading towards their devils, this is a very loaded phrase. Let's understand it bit by bit. They're in solitude. Khalwa. Khalwa means to be alone. From it you get the word khalin. Khalin means empty. Like in Urdu, khaliya. Right? But khalwa means to be alone with someone. And now, the Arabic language is remarkable. When you use khala, you use it with ba. يعني khala bihi. He was alone with him. But the ayah doesn't say, وَإِذَا خَلَوْ بِشَيَاطِينِهِمْ The ayah says, وَإِذَا خَلَوْ إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ When you use the word إِلَىٰ, it actually suggests that they're going towards someone that is of a higher ranking than themselves. You see, if you say خَلَوْ بِهِ then he and I were alone together and we rank the same. But if you say خَلَوْ إِلَيْهِ then I made, like for example, I wanted to get one-on-one time with my teacher. My teacher and I, not the same rank. Obviously, I put him in a higher position than myself. So if I'm going to someone who ranks higher than myself in my eyes, I'm not going to say خَلَوْ بِهِ I'm going to say خَلَوْ إِلَيْهِ So they say خَلَوْ إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ to suggest they've put their shayateen at a higher level than themselves. They want to go get their real suggestion. They come into the believers and say, we're just like you guys. Then they go to the, who they really consider their leaders. And why do we know they consider shayateen their leaders? Because of the word ilah. That's the eloquence of the Qur'an. Just because of ilah we can tell they look up to the shayateen. Now who are these shayateen? They don't go to actual like devils, like you know, fiery creatures and stuff. They don't go to them. They go to their leaders, the leaders of the hypocrites. They go to, in the worst of that company. Yesterday I took my time explaining to you, I, actually all the days are muddled now in my mind, so I don't even know. Sometime in the past, I explained to you that shaitan can enter into your heart. And if you let him in long enough, then a human being becomes a shaitan. 
If you let him live there long enough, then the human being has now become a shaitan. Then shaitan can leave and he's on autopilot, he's all done already. He's already been converted, you understand? So now these are the shayateen that they go back to. And they go back to them and they say, Qalu. They'd say, Inna ma'akum. No, no, no. We're definitely with you guys. We are, we are totally with you. We're not, we're not with them. I mean, I know you saw me today. I went to the gathering of the Muslims and I said, I believe. And you might have gotten worried that, you know, maybe I'm not you know, with you anymore. I just wanted to come and let you know, no, 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 we're, we're totally with you. We're so with you. And then they say, Inna ma nahnu mustahzi'un. We were just joking around. Haza'a in Arabic actually means to make fun of someone, to eventually cause them hurt. To be sarcastic with someone. You know, Haza'a also means in the, in the, meter of, in the meaning of poking. Haza al ibil actually means to kill uh, kill an animal slowly, like if they left the camel outside knowing that it's cold, out of anger at the animal. So they say haza al ibila, he le- he killed the, the 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 camel by the cold. So we're just slowly killing them. We're just being around them so we can keep an eye on them. We're messing with them. We're not serious about them. Inna nahnu mustahzi'un. All we're doing is just joking around with them and kind of playing them along. You know, stringing them along. Now, a couple of things I want to tell you about this ayah. The first of them is some things about the word shaitan. The word shaitan is uh, of remarkable origin. It, has, it, it can be argued to have even Greek origin, like Satan and Satan is used in Hebrew. It's found in previous languages, etc. But it also has an Arabic etymology. In other words, you can trace it back to Arabic roots as well. And in the Arabic root system, it can be reduced to two things. The scholars are divided on which one it goes to, but it's actually pretty interesting that both ways it, it carries a meaning. So there's no re- reason to deny either one. It could go to shata, yashitu, and it could go to shatana. So it could be sheen, ya, and ta, or it could be sheen, ta, and noon. So I'll read the, some of these meanings to you. Shata shay ihtaraqa. It actually means to be set on fire. To be set on fire. And it's used figuratively. Actually, tashiyat is used. Lahmun yuslahu lil qawm yushwa lahum. The, 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 the meat that is ready for the barbecue is called tashiyat. Because it's ready to be set on fire. You could just throw it straight onto the fire. Well, ishata al ihlak bin nar. Ishata actually means to burn somebody to death. Figuratively, someone is called shaitan ala wazan fa'lan, extremely burnt up when they are over and overly enraged. You know, even in, in many cultures, even in, in, in the English language, fire is an expression of anger. Man, I was fuming. You know, you could see smoke coming out of his ears. You know? When we use these expressions, the idea is someone is overwhelmed with what? Rage. So one imagery here is, when they went to the believers, and they demonstrated their faith, their leaders saw it and they got fumed. And now they're going back to their leaders to calm them. No, 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 we're with you guys. Don't get heated up like, don't get burnt up like that. No, no, no. Chill out. You know? Don't, don't get set on fire like that. That's one idea. And of course, shaitan is called shaitan. One, because his eventual home is the fire. Two, because he is enraged with humanity. He is, his hate for Adam alayhi salam set him on fire. It literally set him on fire. You know? And that's why he's, one of the reasons he's called shaitan. Shatana also actually means al-habal to shaddu bihil khayl. The rope with which the horse is tied up. It's also used al-habal alladhi yushtanu bihi ad-dalu. You know like back in the day, you didn't have water on a tap. You had to go to the well to get your water. How do you get the, well from the, uh, the water from the well? You don't just put your hand in. You have to put a, a bucket in. And you have to have a rope that goes down and you pull it back up. Actually, shaitan also suggests the one who pulls the rope slowly. In other words, shaitan casts his bucket towards you, and then you get attracted and he pulls it a little. You ever see like hunters back in the day? You know, they're trying to catch a small animal. They'll put a little bit of food inside of a, uh, tied to a rope, and pull the carrot a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and the animal keeps, you know. This is actually, that's the, the act of shaitan. The act of shaitan. And ala wazan fay'al, this actually suggests that shaitan reels you in. He ropes you in. And this is actually pretty remarkable because Allah uses that exact phrase in Surah Al-A'raf. فَدَلَّاهُمَا بِهُرُورِ He roped them in with the bucket, with using deception. That's the expression used for when he seduced Adam alayhi salam and our mother Hawa. That he used the rope to pull them in. And that's part of the meaning of the word shaitan. But shaitan also means al-ba'id, the one who goes far off the right path. 
And so the idea of shaitan is those that have gone off. They're not going to come back. They're lost for good. So shaitan has several meanings and all of them apply here. These are manipulators. And they've manipulated their people enough, so much so that these people, they want to make sure they've impressed their leaders, no matter what. So even when they spent a little bit of time with the believers, they had to run back to the shayateen and make sure they're happy with them. Because they reeled them in, you know. إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهْزِئُونَ And Allah turns around and says, Allahu يَسْتَهْزِئُ بِهِمْ Allah is making sarcastic fun of them. How is Allah making fun of them? This is actually a very important literary feature of the Qur'an. There are sometimes words that are used that you don't even think they're appropriate for God. Like for example, وَمَكَرُوا They made schemes. وَمَكَرَ Allah And Allah made a scheme. And you're like, wait, that doesn't sound right for Allah. Or here, إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهْزِئُونَ We're making sarcastic jokes. Allah says, Allah يَسْتَهْزِئُ بِهِمْ It is in fact Allah who is making a sarcastic joke towards them. You need to understand, this is the problem of translating things literally and not understanding that this is a language from 1400 years ago. It has principles. What happens is the same verb is used. They used istihza, Allah used istihza. They used makar, Allah used makar. إِنَّهُمْ يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدًا وَأَكِيد Same verb is used, yeah? What that does is, I am responding in kind. What is called in English, to respond in kind. I am giving them what they deserve exactly according to what they've done. So when Allah says, Allah is poking fun of them, the question arises, what could that mean? How would Allah poke fun at anybody? Then Allah Himself explains what that means. Their idea of making fun of the believers was to manipulate them. Allah's teaching of Him making fun of them, He explains Himself, this is the Ataf Bayan, وَيَمُدُّهُمْ فِي تُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ he extends them, in lost in their rebellion, and they're completely blind of judgment. In other words, Allah Azza wa Jal allows them to continue to behave in the way that they are. You want to act this way? Go. Go. You want to disobey more? I'll let you. I'll let you. Allah Azza wa Jal does not stop them. He doesn't put a barricade in front of them. He doesn't punish them right away. He says, you, you wanna, you, you'd like to disobey me some more. You know what? Why don't you go ahead? You know, it's kind of... Uh, I'll tell you what a teacher might do in a class. A teacher notices that a student is misbehaving. And he says, no, I'm not going to catch you yet. Let's see how much more he does. And he just documents what he's doing. The thing is, if the teacher stopped him at the first instant, the kid would have sat down. But if the teacher doesn't stop him, the kid gets more brave, and more brave, and more brave, and pretty soon he's, not, he's standing on his own desk, and pretty soon he's hanging out the window. And then when he calls him, it's time to go to the principal's office, maybe call your parents to the school, and maybe even get you expelled. You understand? The way my teacher gave the example, it hit me, like this was like 15 years ago, and it stuck in my head when he was explaining this ayah. I'll share it with you. You have a, a dog that is rebellious. It bites at you. So you have it tied to a rope, but the rope is like two feet long. So it just, arr, that's all it does, right? So that if, the, if the owner really wants to punish this dog, he should give him a hundred foot rope. Because if you give this dog a hundred foot rope, what's the dog going to do? It's going to run like hell. It's going to run as fast as it can. And 50 feet in, it's going to think, I am free. 90 feet in, top speed. 99, the, wor the world is open before me. What happens at the 100th foot? It's not just that he gets pulled. He gets choked. He's going to fall back. Like if he got pulled at the 2 foot rope, it would have hurt, but not that much. But if he gets pulled at the 100 foot rope, that could kill him, you understand? So it's actually, the joke's on the dog. When you extend the rope. Allah Azza wa says, these people want to act this way. My ultimate joke on them is that I'll let them think that they have the upper hand. I'll let them think that they're getting away with it. We'll see how funny this is. Subhanallah. That's Allah's reaction to you know, the, the munafiqun. About this idea. You know, uh, you know something, it's, it's on the side, but I really want to share it with you, and I hope I'm able to do justice with the subject. Two words of important vocabulary. You know, the, the Qur'an, its language, the Arabs could not figure out how is Allah, how is this man speaking this language? Even though Arabic was their language. There were some things in the Qur'an that they could just not explain. Even though they were masters of Arabic. Okay? And it's hard to explain now to an English audience what some of those things were, but I'll try one of them. 
There are, the Qur'an is revealed over how many years? You guys know? 23 years, yeah? 23, 24, 23 and a half years. This, this is the period of the revelation of the Qur'an. It's about 600 something pages. And it's not all revealed at one time. And in the middle of that revelation, it's also the speech of the Prophet himself, hadith. Right, the Prophet is speaking, and sometimes Qur'an is coming out of him, sometimes hadith is coming out of him. So literally, hundreds of thousands of things have been said by the same man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of them are Qur'an, some of them are hadith. And you'll notice, even from a linguistics point of view, if you gather all the body of hadith, and some ulama have done this, some research scholars have already done this, like Basim Sa'ih, may Allah reward him in his work. They've gathered like the entire corpus of hadith to develop how did the Prophet speak? What was his style of speech? And comparing it to the Qur'an, there's no comparison. Like they don't even sound like the same, it's clearly different authorship. It's not the same author. <laughs> Even though it's coming from the same mouth. And within the Qur'an, Allah did things that wasn't even possible for a human being to do. I'll tell you one of them. Madda in Arabic means to extend. Madda means to extend. Another word for madda is amadda, which also means to extend. Madattuhu, amdattuhu, roughly the same meaning, to extend. Okay, sometimes the mujarrad and the mazid fi carry the same meaning. One is a little more emphatic than the other, but that's it. Now the Arabs actually use them bima'nan, with the same, interchangeably. They didn't think twice when if they were say they would say madda or they would to say amadda, it wouldn't make a difference to them. When you come to the Quran, Allah used both. He used madda and he used amadda. But what Allah did, nobody's ever done before. Throughout the entire Quran, every time Allah talks about giving human beings something, He used amadda, and for everything else, He used madda. He extended our giving to us with the extended form of the word. He says, Yumdidkum bi amwalin wa banin. Numidduhum bihi min malin wa banin. Yumdidkum rabbukum bi khamsati alafin min al malaika. Amdadnahum bi fakihatin wa lahmi min maishtahun. Kulan numiddu ha ulai wa ha ulai min ata irabik. Numiddu, amdadna, numiddu, yumiddu. All of these are from amadda, the extension. The extended word is for when Allah extends His mercy. And every place else every place else, and some of them are about the oceans being extended, some of them are as part of a parable, or the punishment being extended. In this case, Allah will extend them in their rebellion. He doesn't use a madda, He says, يَمُدُّهُمْ فِي تُغْيَانِهِمْ The madda, the lesser form. Consistent for 23 years. It's not like all of these verbs came in one paragraph, so you can organize them neatly. These fit over here, these fit over here. <laughs> SubhanAllah, for Allah to do that over the entire course of the revelation and for linguists to study that centuries later and say, whoa, how did that happen? That can't be an accident. And so he says, وَيَمُدُّهُمْ فِي تُغْيَانِهِمْ And I'll share with you to the, towards the end the word that's used, so beautiful. He says, يَعْمَهُون يَعْمَهُون in Arabic, الْعَمَهْ التَّحَيُّرْ وَالتَّرَدُّدْ أَيْ تَرَدُّدُ النَّظَرْ يَعْمَهُون means shock. Shock. It also means hesitation. In other words, these people are always going to be hesitant to obey Allah and His Messenger and they're going to keep going the wrong way in their rebellion. And they're actually going to be shocked with every time new revelation comes, it's going to offend them. And actually they're going to avoid eye contact with the Prophet because they've got a guilty, you know like a, a student who comes in late to class, avoids eye contact? That's taladudun nadhar. Allah will let them go and keep avoiding eye contact. And they're going to think they slipped away. قَدْ يَعْلَمُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ يَتَسَلَّلُونَ مِنْكُمْ لِوَاذَا Allah says, Allah knows the ones who slip away from you, making excuses. Allah knows those people. Here He says, He'll let them slip away. The, 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 the word عَمَى is also beautiful because it's closely related to عَمَى with a يَا. الْعُمْيَان or عَمَى is blindness. And عَمَى, the comparison between them, they say, like Ibn al-Athir says, الْعَمَهُ فِي الْبَصِيرَةِ كَالْعَمَى فِي الْبَصَرِ is insight, ability to think, ponder and reflect. They are blind to their ability to think. And if Allah used يَعْمَوْن, that would have meant they're blind of the eyes. And again, الْعَمَهُ عَمَ الْقَلْبِ وَالْعَمَ فِي الْبَصَرِ That يَعْمَهُون means they're blind in their hearts now. Their hearts are no longer sensitive. It's actually coming back full circle, you know, عَوْدًا لِذِي بِئْتِ بِدْ You know, it's coming back to where we began. Remember in the beginning their hearts were sealed? And now their hearts are blinded. Their hearts have, are incapable of, uh, of feeling. The last ayah I want to do with you guys today and then go back and look at it from the 
from the, uh, uh, the Jewish point of view, yet again, we looked at it from the Munafiq point of view. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ اشْتَرَوُ الضَّلَالَةَ بِالْهُدَىٰ Those are the people that have purchased misguidance by selling away guidance, by giving, paying the price of guidance. You know they say, الْبَاءُ لِلْمَتْرُوكَ مَعَ فِعْلِ اشْتِرَىٰ They say, بَاءُ is used for what you leave. The idea of purchasing something, what's the only way you can purchase something? When you have cash to give. If you don't have something to give, you cannot purchase. Allah uses, when He uses the phrase Bil Huda here, He's suggesting these poor souls, they had guidance in their possession. They had it. And they, they, they instead purchased misguidance and gave up the guidance that they had. They let go of what they had. That's the expression that's captured here. Allah Azza wa Jalla is describing that even the least of the Muslims, the least of the Muslims, even then they have what in their possession? Allah's guidance. They have it, don't let it go, don't sell it off. You know, and a lot of people have mistranslated this ayah, these people have sold guidance for misguidance. Ishtara is not selling, ishtara is buying. Shara is selling. So it's a, it's a, it's a bad attempt at translation. Sometimes, um, you know, people ask me at the end of these lectures, which translation do you recommend? Um, it's a tough call. Transla uh, recommending a translation is a tough call. But for those of you that are not, you don't know any Arabic and you're just starting out, or whatever, one transition I can say maybe the Oxford University Press, Sheikh, Professor Abdul Halim translation from University of London is a, is a very, very good translation. At least it cap captures the overall meaning. But a lot of times people have come to me with their translation and said, hey, could you recommend my translation? And I open up a couple of ayat and say, why did you do this and this and this? And then they just kind of avoid eye contact and I don't see them again. So I <laughs> don't. But I can't, I can't, in all honesty, I can only recommend the few translations that I see have taken into consideration certain principles, right? So anyway, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ اشْتَرَوُوا الدَّلَالَةَ بِالْهُدَىٰ فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ الرَّبَاحُ أَنَّمَا فِي التَّجْرِ They say uh, their, 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 their businesses or their, their transaction did not produce any benefit for them. Now this whole image of purchasing misguidance in exchange for guidance, what in the world does it mean? You see, the guidance that Allah sent is not easy. The guidance that Allah sent, especially to that community, required a lot of sacrifice. And if you were to try to cut corners and find some ways to not be able to live by it, but still give the impression that you're Muslim, then you're, selling, then you're, you're, you're purchasing misguidance for guidance. You can't keep the impression of Islam and not live by it. You can't keep the impression of loyalty to the Qur'an and not live by it. You have to hold on to both. And so Allah says actually, it's understandable that they would try to do this thing to save themselves. This was actually just a business deal for them, but it didn't produce any benefit for them. مَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ وَمَا كَانُوا مُهْتَدِينَ They were never committed to guidance ever anyway. These were not the kind of people that were committed. I told you before that there are three reactions. Extreme love, no matter what, we're not going to let go of this religion. Extreme hate, no matter what, we're not going to accept this religion. And in between, I don't know if I want to commit. I'm not so sure. And that's actually the word, the word ihtida. Al-ihtida yani al-iltizamu bil-huda. Al-tamassuk bil-huda. When you, when you read the, in the, the Qur'an, you read the word yahtadun, muhtadin, ihtada. You're talking about people who held on to guidance. They didn't want to let go of it. This is ifti'al is used for, for mubalagha. They held on tight to the guidance. Allah says they never held on tight anyway. I don't like the translation of this phrase, وَمَا كَانُوا مُهْتَدِينَ And they were not guided. First of all, that sounds passive and this is active, so it doesn't even make sense. They were not committed to guidance. They weren't willing to hold on to the guidance ever. That's the criticism Allah makes. Meaning, you can only end up at this point if you never had commitment to begin with. Now we go back and I'll show you something remarkable. The duality of the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, I told you there are two groups that are parallel. These ayat could apply to the munafiqun, the hypocrites, and they could also apply to the Jewish community, and, and what's going on within them. Now look at it, the same lessons, but such a different point of view. Allah Azza wa Jal, and I'll go through this rather quickly. When it is said to them, why don't you believe the way people have believed? Because people believe in Allah, and people believe in the last day, but they also believe in the Messenger of Allah. So why are you skipping on the Messenger? Remember they said, Amanna billahi wa bil you know, so now they're told, hey, why is your iman, why is your faith missing this piece? How come you don't believe like the people have believed? They come around and say, You want us to believe like these fools have believed? 
Now, what, what did they mean by fools? We already learned what the hypocrites mean by fools. But what the Jews meant by fools, what the Israelites meant by fools is something else. They believed they were people of education. They, were, they believed they were people of learning. And they believed that the Arabs, especially the Arabs of Makkah, are unlettered, ummiyin. Actually, they used the word ummiyin as an insult. Quran uses it as a noble characteristic of the Prophet but the, but the Jews used it as an insult against him. So they said, you, you want us with our PhDs in Sharia to Tawrat, with our ijazat, extended ijazat, and all of my years of study, my scholarship, you want me to believe like these uneducated people? You want me to come down to their level? Excuse me? Anu'minu kama amanu sufaha? Allah says, all that education aside, ala innahum humus sufaha. They're the ones, in fact, that are the fools. And then Allah adds insult to injury when He says, وَلَكِنْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And however, they don't even know. Man, the one thing they took pride in was knowledge. The one thing they had over the rest of the Arabs was what? Knowledge. And Allah Azza wa Jalla slapped them across the face and said, وَلَكِنْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ They don't even know. They don't even know what it means to truly believe. They don't even understand what it is. They don't know what the purpose of revelation is. You know, the mistakes, it's so important to study the mistakes that their scholars made with their book. And their, their class, the religious class made with their book, so we don't repeat the mistake. You know what they did with their book, just to summarize? They, they got into details, and they, they, they lost themselves in the furur. They lost themselves in this subcategories of subcategories of subcategories, and lost sight of what this religion is altogether. They would, they would debate issues endlessly and big disobedience to Allah is happening in front of their face, no problem. They would have, you know, the, when, when your priorities in religion get twisted, then you suffer from the disease that they, they suffered from. You can be discussing a mas'ala of whether or not the wudu is better this way or this way, or is it leather socks or cotton socks, or should you raise your hands and not raise your hands. And there are orphans outside the masjid crying. And nobody even talks about it. Uh, that's not the religion of Islam. I don't know what you just turned that into. That's closer to the rabbinic tradition than anything else. There, there are, there's, you know, there are, there are literally crimes happening in front of our eyes. Things like blatant racism, something that the deen attacked from the very beginning. Blatant racism, corruption, lying, cheating, stealing, in our face. And no problem. And the worst examples of it are actually sometimes in the, the, the Ummah, the Muslim world, where you, go to, you, you hope to go there to see the best of the Ummah. Islam lives here. And you go and you just cry. You just cry. When you see like religiously knowledgeable people, knowledgeable, like the Hufad, Ulama, you know, or religious, if not even, if not even scholars, and a, a servant comes to give them tea, and they talk to him like he's an animal. Would Rasulullah ever speak to anyone this way? Would he speak to his servants this way? Why are you speaking to him this way? What gives you the right? How do you know that on the day of judgment, he's not looking above and down at you? How do you know his place before Allah? And this is at the hands not of those who don't know the religion. This unfortunately at the hands of who do know the religion. How in the world? So they did, they were able to create this cognitive dissonance, they can study the uloom, get the ijazat, know a lot of the texts, and quote it and be academic, and yet when it comes to carrying the character of Islam, there's nowhere to be found. This is, this is foolishness. If, if that's not foolishness, we don't know what is. إِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا When those same members of the Israelite community came to the Prophet ﷺ, and they came to the believers, they said, we believe like you do, we have iman too. But when they go back to their shayateen, their heads, they said, no, 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 we're not with them. Yeah, I know we tried to say we have some things common with them and ourselves, but no, come on, seriously, we're not with them. We're with you. We're just kidding. Allahu yastahzi Allah is, Allah is actually, the joke's on them. As far as Allah is concerned, the joke's on them. وَيَمُدُّهُمْ فِي تُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُمْ And He's going to let them go with this mockery. He's going to let them pretend that they believe. He's going to let them continue to play games with their Torah, even though the Qur'an has come. He'll let them do it. And then he says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ اشْتَرَوْا الضَّلَالَةَ بِالْهُدَىٰ What bigger example than, than that group in Medina? 
these are people that have purchased misguidance by selling off guidance. They literally read their book and saw Quran and saw the Prophet ﷺ confirm what they have in their revelation and decide to close that chapter anyway. Then this sale, that they, this business transaction they've engaged in has not produced any benefit for them. And he concludes, وَمَا كَانُوا مُهْتَدِينَ And by the way, that community and their leaders, they were never committed to guidance anyway. They had reduced their religion to a business anyway. They had turned it for, they had changed the religion and altered it for political means anyway. What commitment to guidance did they have to begin with? So what do you expect? وَمَا كَانُوا مُهْتَدِينَ So with this, as I conclude, inshallah ta'ala, I'll prepare you for tomorrow. Tomorrow is actually the conclusion of this subject. Hypocrisy has been going on for some time, you know this, right? It's the longest subject so far. Iman was very concise, kufr was very concise, and then kufr adjacent to kufr was the hidden form of kufr, hidden form of disbelief, this nifaq. And it concludes tomorrow. And when it concludes tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, it concludes with one of the most elaborate set of parables, examples, images that Allah has given in the Qur'an. You know, it's some of the most complicated study in the Qur'an is the images, but when you ponder and reflect and really understand them, you'll learn something so beautiful about the Qur'an. Allah literally paints a picture with words. There's a scene going to happen in front of you. And when you understand that scene, you'll understand what Allah is getting across. You know, subhanAllah. And so that's what we're going to try to appreciate. It's actually in the order of the Qur'an, the first parable in the Qur'an. It's the first example, set of examples in the Qur'an. So I'm excited to share that with you tomorrow, inshaAllah ta'ala. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Also, I have a surprise for you tomorrow. What I won't tell you. Because it's a surprise. Because if I told you, it wouldn't be a surprise. Okay.